Hi, my name is Caroline Bonneman. I work as an eco rep at the University of Texas at Dallas under the Sustainability Office. Um, and today I'm going to be going over um, how we kept students engaged during quarantine and through like virtual, um, a virtual setting because that was pretty difficult to navigate. Um, specifically, I'm going to be focusing on, focusing on two of the SDGs, um, SDG 2, Zero Hunger, and SDG 4, Quality Education, because those are both two problems that we, we faced during COVID and that we we're pretty successful in addressing it, I feel. Um, so just some quick background. I, again, I'm an eco rep, so I am a student employee. Um, eco reps are a group of student employees who kind of work to bridge the, the gap between the Office of Sustainability and the students and make sure that we represent the student voice and make sure that what they're interested in, we discuss. Um, so I started this job about two and a half years ago. So I, I worked for like a semester before COVID started and then I worked all through COVID. And then now, now that we're seeing like the end of well, maybe not the end, but a break in the quarantine. Um, I'm still working. So I've been in all those different environments and I've gotten to see the wax and the wane and how we um, kept people involved and learned a lot of stuff. Um, specifically, the projects that I manage on campus are our community garden, um, our composting program and our campus forest, along with a couple other smaller things. So I do have a lot of experience with um, the specific projects on campus where we're trying to draw in students and we all know how difficult of a challenge that can be. Um, so I just want to cover three things that worked pretty well. Some of them, I feel like these all seem pretty clear and um, straightforward, but it's still nice to see like the specifics of what worked. Um, collaboration, I think this one was our most important um, because we, the eco reps and I are student employees, we're not an actual club. We don't have um, like a group of students that we're like super connected with. Um, so we worked really hard to communicate with other sustainability clubs and make sure that we are all in conversation about our plans, what was happening and problems that people had. Um, and I'll go into the specifics of how we did all this in a little bit. Um, and then virtual access, again, pretty obvious whenever everybody has to be online, but we found a lot of success with moving a lot of our programs that, you know, maybe could have been online the whole time to online and making sure that it was very accessible, very easy to access um, and kind of removing a specific time slot requirement and people could just access it whenever and then like sign off that they've done it or take like a post quiz or something. Um, so we found that to be pretty successful. And then again, another obvious one, outdoor small groups. Um, our campus has a lot of nice outdoor spaces that we usually maintain with the help of students. Like we have um, volunteer days to like clean up trash. Um, we have a community garden that takes a lot of effort for on volunteers parts. So we were pretty concerned about maintaining these spaces when nobody's on campus and when we can't really meet in um, large groups. So um, we, we did a lot of like breaking up larger events into smaller ones and just maintaining like a community, but in smaller groups. So to talk about our Im implementation of collaboration, we held something called the Green Convene. It was a meeting held by the eco reps um, and it gathered pretty much every sustainability club that we could find or think of on campus. Um, we just like grabbed them all together, got them on like an email chain and tried to get them to start conversation. And then for our event, what we did is we had um, everybody present a brief explanation of their club, their goals for the year with COVID in mind, um, and then any help that they needed or any specific things that they were like going to struggle with throughout the year or that they maybe needed some additional assistance on from other clubs. Um, some examples of that, we had some smaller clubs who maybe had some nice ambitious goals and projects, but didn't have maybe like the student involvement or like the network that they needed so we could advertise maybe, hey, this um, volunteer event is happening this Saturday on the pages of different clubs and get more people involved. Um, Instagram was actually kind of our best friend throughout this um, throughout this because a lot of our campus organizations have Instagram pages with quite a few followers. And whenever you start advertising across pages, you can actually reach a pretty good amount of the student population through helping each other out and advertising each other's projects. Um, and so we did try to get a lot of different parts of sustainability involved. Um, we did not just like conservation groups, but also like mental health organizations, equal rights group, because all of these were important topics normally, but also especially important during COVID. Um, and so we created a um, like a formalized uh, method of communication between our clubs at the screen convene um, to go forward. So we had our meeting, but then we had a formal way to communicate. We um, have a Slack channel for all of our clubs related to sustainability. And I really feel like this is something we should have done before COVID. But the results of um, the Green Convene and this constant communication is that, you know, we get to actually talk 
very easily to other members of clubs. We don't always have to set up like a specific meeting or like worried about COVID restrictions. We can just like send a message. Um, and this really has helped increase communication between students and faculty and um, just different clubs. We actually ended up holding two green convenes, one in the beginning of COVID when we were not really sure what the year looked like and how we wanted to go about events. And then we held one later um, in the year once we had our kind of our feet underneath us to just share where clubs were and um, any problems that they had. Um, I've listed out a, some of the like good results of this collaboration attempt, um, but to read off some of the more specific ones, um, we were able to identify some problems that students were facing that maybe the administration or even the ECREPs weren't really aware of. For example, our we have a program called the Comic Cupboard where students can go to get, it's like a food bank where they can go and get food if they're needing some you know extra stuff. And we weren't really aware that they were struggling um, through COVID as more students were using the resource and they were receiving less funding. So we were able to collaborate with other clubs to come up with um, solutions, uh, food drives. We actually addressed it in the community garden and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but it was just a very good way and it continues to be a very good way um, to share resources across organizations because you know, a lot of us have the same goal, but we just gotta, gotta work to get together a little bit to um, accomplish it. And having a set method of communications between the group was really nice. Instead of just email after email, we had you know, a group way to communicate. Um, virtual access, obviously, again, very important during COVID. Um, but to highlight specifically something that we did is we had something called the Comet Composting Program. And this was a composting program where people would have to attend trainings in person. They would be led by like me or the supervisor and students would come learn how to compost. They would get this bin. It was a lot of paperwork. It was, was a lot of scheduling meetings and we got a pretty bad turnout just to begin with. Um, during COVID, I realized, okay, I need to redo this. We can make this work virtually. It doesn't need to be in person and it can't be in person now. Um, so we were able to transfer the training information and like all the required information to website instead of having continual trainings so we had it listed in a video and afterwards students would take like you know a pretty short quiz to prove that they'd seen the video um, and we had a pretty amazing response to this um, previously we had like about 20 people who were active in the composting program which was not great um, over the course of about a year we got it up to a hundred um, so having students so ha having this option where students could watch it online um, did work pretty well. Previously, students, one of the most common reasons for saying that they couldn't compost is saying that they didn't have time to attend the trainings. So by making these accessible at any point and not just come to a training, learn how to do it, um, we got a ton more people involved. Um, we had a place where they could just come and pick up and drop off their compost bins at any time. It didn't need to be like, didn't need to really meet with anybody. Um, so all that worked out pretty well. In addition, we used, as I talked about earlier, we've been utilizing social media quite a bit um, over the quarantine. We did a composting challenge. Um, so basically people just post like, hey, I joined the program and they would be um, listed to get like a prize. You know, it's, it's a little gimmicky, but it gets people involved. It gets people talking about it, which is a lot of what you need whenever you're trying to get a um, program off the ground. So yeah, we increased our student participation by about five times, which again, maybe isn't saying too much considering they're only 20 people to begin with, but we're still seeing a lot of growth. We're seeing a lot of responses and we're actually having to order more compost bins, which we did not expect, but it's very exciting. Um, and this increases the accessibility of it because it is available at any point online. Um, we've considered doing in-person trainings again once um, maybe quarantine lets up a little bit, that way that students who maybe don't have computers at home or don't have a ton of access to that can participate there, but we're gonna play that as we see it. Um, this also just reduced a lot of the effort on our part. Um, we're previously having these trainings that are very complicated and a lot of like, you know, submit this form, submit this form, come and get this. And now it's just automatic. It's online. People can do it at any point. Um, one effect that I personally didn't really foresee a whole bunch is that having comic composting bigger, have, having a lot more people involved actually increased program visibility about a lot of different things on campus. People started emailing me being like, hey, I really enjoy the composting program. What's something else I can get involved in? Um, and it was pretty surprising to see that people were still looking for programs and engaging in like the summer of 
quarantine when nobody could do anything. Um, so it was a pretty big success. And I'm pretty proud of the fact that we managed to get all that up and running in a very short amount of time and to make it an effective program that now a lot of people are interested in. Um, small groups, um, something else we implemented, we have our community garden. It um, grows a lot of food for plot holders and plot owners. And we were pretty concerned about COVID because it would be very difficult to get people to come to the garden. We couldn't hold our usual monthly work days, which is when we all come out. We do like community tasks like mulching or caring for the garden or weeding. And then we have people work on their individual things. So instead, we split it up into like what we call work weeks. Every day of the week, um, about five students could sign up and come in the morning and have like a small group um, work on the garden. And so obviously we didn't get as much done as we would have on a usual work day, but given those five days and having like, you know, 20 to 30 people out there every week, we managed to get quite a bit done. Um, Additionally, we addressed um, a problem that we that I talked about earlier, which was the comic cover and having enough food. Um, through some of our collaboration attempts, we started growing some um, particularly productive plants that the community garden could use, such as like potatoes and onions, and help supplement what they already had, as well as doing some food drives for obviously you know, the usual canned goods, those kinds of things. Um, and we had such a good response to these work days. It was pretty exciting. Um, a lot of people were very eager to just get outside and see people other than like their roommates. So we had a lot more people like raring to sign up than we thought we'd do what we did, we would. Um, and they remained popular throughout the semester and into the summer. Um, so some of the positive results of that, we maintained maintenance of the community garden. It looked so good throughout COVID, which was a miracle. We were all very excited. Um, we produced food year round. Um, most of the food that produces in the garden goes to individual plot holders, the people who own their plot and maintain that plot. But since we set aside plots for the comic cupboard, we were able to produce a lot of food to donate um, to the comic cupboard, which then goes back to helping feed our campus, which is a really nice direct way to, you know, give back. Um, additionally, this, this was just such a good way to maintain a sense of community at the garden and keep people in, engaged in a way that wasn't Digitally, it wasn't virtually, it didn't involve like email, didn't involve teams. We had people coming outside, being in the garden, um, and just like actually getting to meet people. Um, one thing that was that surprised me personally is that we got a lot of new people joining the garden. Um, I kind of figured that we would only get like the, the old timers, you know, come in to maintain their plots. But a lot of freshmen who never experienced um, in person college were like chomping at the bit to go and meet people and do something hands-on. Um, so it was really fun to see everybody get involved in this um, and actually like learn some things. And because it was smaller groups, we were able to do a lot more like one-on-one -on -one specific teaching. So a lot of those new gardeners that we had, um, and we had a lot, were able to talk maybe one-on-one -on -one with an experienced gardener and learn you know, what they can grow, what they can do with their plot um, in a way that you know, we hope that we can maintain in larger groups, but it's probably a little bit better smaller. So in conclusion, um, we really thought that we would see a decline of student engagement during COVID and during like virtual engagement. And we did at first, but by being pretty intentional about our communication and our collaboration, um, we were able to keep it going as strong or stronger. We've had a lot of programs that have had, like the comic composting that have had more engagement, um, some things that just changed like the community garden. Um, we learned a lot about what we should keep online and what we shouldn't. Um, for example, the Comet composting, maybe that always should have been an online program. Maybe maybe that was the best way to run it. And so we can consider that moving forward with um, events. Maybe it doesn't need to be in person. Maybe we can also just provide information and access online. Um, so that's some things that we're gonna, we're gonna take forward depending, uh, even though the circumstances of the future are a little bit uncertain. Um, yeah. So thank you for listening. I've attached my email and my office. If anybody has any questions, they can feel free to email me or contact me or like for collaboration, whatever. Um, so yeah, thanks for listening.